Okay. Good afternoon. It's uh, time to start. We are really already uh, seven minutes late, so let's get started. It's a session on uh, left main and multivessel PCI practice changes after ischemia. <laughs> I'm moderating this together with my colleague and friend, uh, Mamas Mamas. And we have a great panel uh, around us with Andreas Eglis, uh, William Fer Ferren, uh, Fahim Haider, Jafari, Nils Johnson, Dimitris Kampaliotis, Joshi uh, Unuma, Imad Scheiban and Heik Yun Yun. Um, without further ado, let's start with our first speaker, um, Fahim Haya Yafa. Yafari, sorry. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, give this talk. Um, I don't have any, any disclosures related to this talk. I do have a disclaimer, though, that I wear several hats. Uh, I'm a nuclear and CT cardiologist, but I'm primarily an interventionalist, and so I do PCI for a living. And so hopefully this will be a f relatively fair and balanced view of, uh, of the, th uh, the situation. So um, I don't know why the slide's looking a bit odd, but the question we're trying to answer is, has the ischemia trial changed practice for left main disease, and has it changed practice for non-left main multivessel disease? Um, so when you talk about left main disease, I think the answer is very simple. The answer is no. And the reason for that is that if you look at the ischemia trial, which we just talked about a lot, um, stable coronary artery disease, randomized to invasive versus, non -inv uh, versus conservative strategy, for the majority of patients, left main disease was excluded by a CT scan, except for those who had CKD. And so left main was excluded in this trial, and, and for left main disease, revascularization remains uh, the, the preferred strategy. And of course, that's driven by uh, data, you know, the, uh, old data. Uh, uh, medical therapy has terrible outcomes with left main disease. And when you compare revascularization with cabbage versus medical therapy, uh, strong uh, improvement in mortality. But of course, the important thing to remember is that this is historical and perhaps relatively obsolete data, but that's the data we have. And to date, there's been no uh, trial of modern medical therapy versus revascularization uh, for left main disease, and we just have to leave it at that. And, and on the other hand, when you look at treatment for left main disease or how to treat it, there's plenty of data. You have syntax, pre-combat, using relatively more all comers. You have Noble and Excel use, uh, looking at relatively uh, simple or a moderate complexity disease. And the bottom line is that with cabbage, the mortality is the same or marginally reduced, except for the more complex patients. And there's, of course, a reduction in spontaneous MI, a reduction in repeat revascularization, with a price to pay with a slight increase in the risk of stroke. Uh, and so when you look at the guidelines, there you have the European and you have the American guidelines. The European guidelines are slightly older. Uh, you know, uh, for, for left main disease with low syntax score, PCI gets a class one recommendation. But for more complex disease, PCI has a class three recommendation. On the other hand, for uh, in the American guidelines, Card, you know, overall, it's a class 2A for uh, PCI and left main disease, but with the sort of the, the, the fine print that for only those patients on whom PCI can achieve something close to cabbage. And we can debate that, but the question of how to do it and, and who should do it, hopefully Dr. Mamas will talk about that in the next talk. Now, the next question is that has ischemia changed practice for multivessel disease? And I think the answer over here is a sort of a yes and no, in the sense that you've got to ask this question with a little bit more detail. Are you talking about uh, for symptoms? Are you symptom relief? Are you talking about for improvement of prognosis? And I apologize that the slides are looking a bit strange over here, but you know, you get the point. And so for the answer, for symptom relief, the answer is unequivocally no. Ischemia trial has made no difference. Uh, practice continues the way it is. But for improving prognosis, I think the ischemia trial has changed practice. So let's talk about symptom relief at the outset. Um, it is always appropriate to revascularize when a patient is symptomatic. And we know from the ischemia trial that there is a durable benefit in angina. Uh, however, that benefit is limited largely to those with daily or weekly angina, which was about 20% of the patients. And it's important to understand that, it's, that revascularization will improve flow and will relieve the, the stenosis. But there is also, we have to be cognizant of the fact that there is also a placebo effect of PCI, because when you compare uh, real PCI versus fake PCI, Actually, both groups do benefit, so, there's, so the benefit of PCI or revascularization in general has a sort of a dual, a dual effect. Now, when you talk about for improving prognosis, um, I think it's important to understand that, um, you know, ischemia trial has changed our outlook because PCI for most patients um, with stable disease does not 
alter the prognosis. And, you know, I just draw your attention when the ischemia trial enrolled a pretty high risk group of patients, moderate to severe ischemia, most uh, of them had LAD disease, most of them had multivessel disease. So high risk, albeit not the highest risk cohort. And when you look at the composite outcome, death, MI, hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, or cardiac arrest, no difference in the primary endpoint. When you look at the secondary endpoint of death or MI, no difference. When you look at MI itself, there's a signal of a reduced spontaneous MI in the later phase, but that's with the price of an increased procedural MI earlier, so no overall difference. And even when you look at the longer-term follow-up of ischemia, no difference in total death. Uh, there was a reduction in cardiovascular death, but there was an increase in non-cardiovascular death, so it's a bit hard to know what that means, but no difference in total death. So when you look at then subgroups, actually no subgroup benefited from revascularization, and this is new because prior to that, we always believed that patients with you know, mild, mod moderate to severe ischemia will benefit uh, from revascularization. We always believe that more vessel disease will benefit from revascularization, but that, the trial didn't show that. And then proximal LED versus no proximal LED, no difference in revascularization. And so no matter how much ischemia you had or no matter what the extent of coronary disease was, revascularization did not alter prognosis, and that is different from what we used to previously believe. Now, you may talk about exclusion of patients, and so left main was excluded in ischemia, and low EF was, was excluded from ischemia, and that is true. However, I draw your attention to the more recently published uh, revived BSIS trial, all, admittedly not an ischemia trial population, but patients with low EF, PCI versus medical therapy, no benefit of revascularization over medical therapy over a medium fo median follow-up of 40, uh, 41 months. So it's unclear what, whether revascularization will really benefit this population uh, or not. The question then comes is that why was this treating ischemia not prognostic? We always think ischemia is something that is needed to be treated. And I draw your attention to the fact that when patients have ischemia, of course they have a tight lesion that you may relieve with stenosis, or with, with a stent or with a graft, but at the same time they have a ton of other plaques in the, in the coronary tree that are mild, potentially vulnerable, and the prognosis over the long term is driven not by relieving uh, the, the ischemia in this tight lesion, but it's these plaques that may rupture and produce acute coronary syndromes, myocardial infarction, and sudden death. And so when you look at the guidelines, the, the European as well as the American guidelines, of course, for left main disease, for multivessel disease with low EF, uh, refractory angina, appropriately at this point, uh, revascularization still has uh, class one indication. However, when you talk about, uh, you know, entities that we previously would unequivocally say need to be revascularized, there's been a downgrade. They've downgraded uh, single or double vessel disease, in, disease involving the prox LED, multivessel disease with normal EF, and multivessel disease with sort of mi mild EF. Uh, and ischemic burden, something that we as cardiologists always talk about, we've been brought up to think about it. Um, you know, in the European guidelines, of course, high ischemic burden need to, need to revascularize. And the, American, the more recent American guidelines have been relatively silent on it, sort of moving away from an ischemia-centric approach to, to a more anatomical and, and holistic approach. Um, so to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, what has changed after the ischemia trial? Um, Nothing has changed for acute coronary syndrome. So whatever we've talked about has got nothing to do with acute coronary syndrome. If you have ACS, you need to revascularize. And I just want to make sure that everyone understands that. Uh, clinical practice for left main disease has not changed. I think the way to go at this point is to revascularize. Even though we don't have good data for medical therapy, at this point, that's what we should be doing. On the other hand, for non-left main disease, I think clinical practice has changed after ischemia in the sense that it is still re reasonable to revascularize somebody for symptoms. Um, revascularization does not improve, however, prognosis in most patients. Um, and so an initial medical therapy approach is reasonable. Now, it's important to understand that this does not mean that revascularization is necessarily a bad thing. All we're talking about is the initial step. Uh, ischemia trial was looking at the initial strategy. And it, it just means that you can start with tablets and then see how the patient does. I think there are some unanswered questions uh, from ischemia, and one of them is that, you know, are the highest risk patients still medically treatable? The ischemia trial did not include the highest risk patients. There were more patients with moderate than very severe ischemia. We were part of the trial, and I know a lot of patients didn't get included, so that's something to, to keep in mind. 
Will Lefman disease, it's heresy to think about it, but will Lefman disease be actually medically treatable in the future? We don't have data. So at this point, the answer is no. But that's something to keep in mind. And what will the 10-year follow-up show? Maybe will extended follow-up, you know, going, going up to 10 years, actually show a benefit of revascularization in this cohort? We don't know. And then finally, the issue of low EF without angina, to me, is still now a question uh, after revived BSIS uh, and, and, and other data. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. We continue with uh, Mamas Mamas um, about how should do left main who should do left main and how? <laughs> so, thank you for the introduction. I gave this talk yesterday, so if you've seen it, apologies, you can always leave. Um, so, my name's Mamas Mamas. I'll be talking about how to do left main and who should do it more importantly. I guess the first question when discussing this topic is whether you should do left main PCI at all. I mean, we have guidelines. We have guidelines around the sorts of patients that should have coronary artery bypass grafting. And certainly for those with complex anatomy with a syntax score of over 33 that are surgical candidates, you probably shouldn't be doing PCI in those patients. Assuming that the case is indicated, uh, the first thing that one should do is access site choice. I mean, you should always go radial first. Uh, this is data from the United Kingdom showing adoption of radial access for the left main. Up to 2014, 60% of all left mains were radial. Currently in the UK, it's about 95%. And you can see that the radial access site is associated with a reduction in major bleeding complications and access site-related bleeding. Now, you may say, well, okay, uh, this is observational data. How do we know this is actually relevant? I mean, it's biased, clearly. Um, well, we have um, data from randomized control trials from Adela Aminian, um, again, showing very similar findings, showing in complex PCI, needing seven French guides. Um, there is a benefit of going radial, particularly in relation to access site-related bleeding complications. The second question is, where should you do it? Do you need surgical cover to do your left main PCI? And the answer is no. This is data from the United Kingdom. Again, my group has published this. Looking at surgical versus non-surgical centers, around up to about 45% of all left main PCIs in the UK are undertaken in um, non-surgical centers. And you can see that there's absolutely no difference in outcomes, whether it be in hospital mortality, MACE, major bleeding, or emergency cabbage. And if anything, uh, non-surgical centers in the United Kingdom undertake more complex patients, higher risk patients, and are more likely to use intravascular imaging. And that nicely moves us on to the use of intravascular imaging. Um, frankly, you shouldn't be doing left main unless you're using intravascular imaging. I think it's criminal to be doing PCI without intravascular imaging for this group of patients. I think it's useful because it helps understand the plaque morphology, the plaque burden in the vein vessel and side branch. It helps you define the bifurcation angles. It helps you characterize calcium, particularly around how circumferential it is, the depth of the calcium, and helps you decide how to prepare your lesion. And it also gives you information about the optimal expansion and stent result. Um, this is data from the UK, again, um, looking at um, use of intravascular imaging associated with uh, left main PCI outcomes. This is over 10,000 PCIs, and you can see that using intravascular imaging um, is associated with a reduction of around 30% in uh, mortality in these cases. We also have um, Korean data, even longer, 10-year outcome data uh, for left main intravascular imaging, and you can see that um, imaging is associated with a reduction in all-cause death, as well as a composite of all-cause death, MI, or stroke, so use imaging. Um, and finally, this is um, the Renovate trial, um, again, showing benefits in complex PCI, as well as in the unprotected left main subgroups. So there's no reason that you shouldn't use imaging, and actually you shouldn't be doing PCI to the left main without imaging. I think it's important to have familiarity with how to assess calcium and how to use the tools to treat calcium, such as rotablation, lithotripsy, and so forth. This is one of many algorithms published about when you should use these devices and how you should use them based on imaging criteria. I'm not going to go through this in depth, um, but needless to say that we know that um, intravascular, uh, that intracoronary calcification, um, whether it be in left main or non-left main lesions, is associated with increased rates of clinical events and target lesion failure. So it's important to prepare your vessel uh, properly and treat your calcium properly. 
You need to think about what platform you're using. I mean, very often, you know, we just stick in a 3.5 stent in the LAD and hope it will expand to the appropriate size in the left main. Um, but we can see from this slide, an old uh, paper from uh, my good friend Nicholas Foyne, that 3.5 uh, stents in the different platforms expand to very much different sizes. And so you need to consider um, what size you want to expand it to, particularly when going from LAD to left main. And again, the importance of using imaging. In terms of one versus two uh, stent approaches, I guess it depends on whether it's a true or a non-true bifurcation. For non-true bifurcation, I would always advocate the provisional approach, so a stent um, either from the circumflex or the LAD to the left main, always pot. I don't routinely final kiss unless there's a side branch compromise, and then I do, but remember, always pot at the end. Uh, for true bifurcations, the approach uh, for one versus two stents very much depends on the anatomy or the severity of the side branch disease. We know from the definition two trial that certainly uh, for complex disease, there very much is better outcomes associated with the use of a two stent approach compared to the provisional approach. Uh, we have DK Crush. I mean, one of the th important things to say about DK Crush was that this was in the hands of a highly selected group of operators. These operators had very large uh, volumes. They did 50 left mains a year for several years, and they also had to submit a DK Crush um, case to a committee before they were allowed to participate in this trial. So whether this data applies um, to people in this audience, including myself, I don't know. But what we find in the DK Crush 5 trial is superiority of two stent approach, uh, mainly with the DK Crush over the provisional approach. And certainly, whilst the P for interaction is negative, there seems to be much greater numerical benefit in the complex group compared to the simple groups where the differences are much smaller and non significant statistically. EBC Main. Um, Again, randomize um, a two stent approach, default versus provisional. Um, the thing about EBC main was that this was a far uh, less complex group than the DK Crush 5 trial with much shorter um, side branch uh, disease. Um, and here you can see that at one year, certainly there's no significant difference um, between a stepwise provisional approach and the systematic dual approach. We're going to see the three year data at um, Euro PCR next week. Whether it will be any different, who knows? I suspect it probably won't. I suspect that we're going to see equivalents. Um, in, EB, um, in the provisional and two stent approach. The thing that, again, that I would highlight is use imaging in both um, EBC main and DK crush trials. Disappointingly, very low uh, rates of imaging were used. Finally, should all of us be doing left main PCI? Frankly, no. Um, I think it really should be restricted to people that achieve certain volumes. Uh, this is data from the UK PCI registry. BSIS showing um, 12 month mortality, procedural complications, periprocedural MIs relate to volume. The greater your volume, the lower it is. So if you're a low volume operator that only does one or two left mains a year, don't do them. Get a colleague uh, to help you or give them to a colleague. So I think in conclusion, left main PCI is reasonable as long as you do it well. And when I talk about doing it well, intracoronary imaging is a must. It's mandatory for all cases. I think for simple cases, use a provisional approach. For complex cases, probably a two stent approach. There's a volume outcome relationship. I don't think you should be doing this unless you do left main and are comfortable doing uh, left main. Always use the radial approach. Um, even in seven French, I mean, our Japanese colleagues have shown us uh, with slender techniques such as sheathless guides, 010 uh, compatible systems. Um, you can use seven French um, radially. And frankly, there's very few cases that you need anything bigger than a seven French. So with that, um, I pass back to the chairman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mamas. Um, we continue with uh, the next speaker is Yoshinubo Onuma. We will talk about coronary CT angiography for decision making. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. So uh, uh, the talk of um, uh, my talk is about coronary CT angiography. So uh, uh, coronary CTA was uh, gradually endorsed by the multiple society and guidelines. Initial one was the NICE from the British uh, uh, um, uh, NICE uh, recommendation, uh, which recommend the CT as a first line test for the chest pain in 2017. Uh, later on, uh, 2019, this CT was also endorsed as the first uh, initial test to diagnose coronary artery disease in a patient with 
with the coronary, uh, chronic coronary syndrome. And then the 2021 also CT was uh, um, endorsed as one uh, uh, recommendation for CT is useful for exclusion of atherosclerotic plaque and obstructive CAD. So uh, the coronary CT is becoming more and more common and we frequently have this information uh, before uh, uh, going to the cath lab or the cabbage. So uh, uh, what the CT can do? First of all, they can, uh, uh, CT can rule out the epicardial uh, disease uh, in some uh, techniques that potentially we could also uh, exclude the uh, microvascular disease. CT can also detect the high-risk plaque uh, for the future uh, event. Uh, for the patient with the functional uh, significance uh, to disease, uh, one vessel is two vessel disease, the PCI planning is possible. And for the patient with uh, three vessel disease or left main disease, uh, CT can provide a syntax score or the global uh, burden of the atherosclerosis and also evaluate the anatomy of the uh, three vessel disease. And potentially, uh, CT could also give the uh, plan for the surgical uh, planning or the PCI planning. So uh, it's already shown, so uh, I'm not going to the detail, but the, for the ESC guideline, at least for the left main and three vessels, you, we need a syntax score to, to, uh, uh, to, to discuss that uh, uh, indication of the revascularization or the revascularization mode uh, in the heart team. Uh, probably in the US, uh, there's a slightly different uh, um, guidelines, uh, especially for the uh, left main, that's the uh, PCI is still 2A in the American guidelines. And uh, also it's important that the, uh, uh, to say that to select the patient with uh, uh, significant left main stenosis for whom PCI can provide equivalent devascularization uh, compared to the cabbage. So the uh, assessment of the anatomy is still important for this uh, ACC guidelines. And again, for the left main uh, in European guidelines, the syntax score is the, uh, uh, used to stratify the patient and make a clinical decision between the cabbage and the PCI. So uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, um, uh, Carlos uh, uh, Colet, uh, who is also in the audience uh, here uh, reported uh, in the syntax three trial. Uh, in this syntax two trial, the uh, three trial, we randomize heart team virtually. So it's not the randomization of the patient, but we randomize heart team, two heart teams, and one uh, heart team make a decision or whether the patient should go for the cabbage or the PCI uh, based on the angiography, and the other team uh, did the same assessment and decision making based on the CT. And we look at the agreement of these uh, two heart team uh, making a decision about uh, uh, mode of the revascularization of the patient uh, with the three vestiges or the left main. So uh, if you look at the syntax score uh, derived from the invasive angiography or the CT-based angiography, there was uh, some good correlation, but a little bit uh, uh, some variance uh, in uh, some of the cases. If you look, uh, use these uh, clinical variables, uh, like to do the syntax two score or the syntax score 2020, they all this uh, uh, um, mortality assessment for the PCI or cabbage will be very similar if you use the uh, invasive angiography or the uh, CT. So uh, um, the primary endpoint of the syntax three was quite reassuring. If you use the uh, CT uh, um, um, for the clinical decision making of the cabbage or PCI in the patient with the three vessel disease or P uh, left main, uh, there was a co concordance of in. Uh, 93% of the patient. Cohen's kappa was 0.82, which is almost perfect uh, uh, correlation between these uh, two heart team. So uh, uh, this trial demonstrated that CT could be used for the decision making of the selection of revascularization mode between the cabbage or PCI. But the question remains whether the surgeons can operate the cabbage solely based on this uh, uh, coronary CTA. So uh, uh, we are performing this fast track cabbage trial where the um, the, we test the feasibility and safety of the planning and execution of cabbage solely based on CCTA combined with FFRCT without knowledge of the anatomy defined by the invasive coronary angiography. So the surgeon must operate on the only, uh, based on the information uh, only 
uh, based on the uh, coronary CT. So in this case, um, also we have a 30 days uh, uh, CT assessment to check the safety of the patient. So this is uh, one of the examples from this uh, fast track uh, trial. You could see the three stenosis, moderate stenosis in the right coronary artery, uh, left main uh, LAD was severely uh, diffusely diseased. There was a two other stenosis in the uh, uh, circumflex. So if you look at the uh, uh, FFRCT analysis, you could see that the right coronary artery, despite the fact there's a three lesions, the distal FFRCT is 0 0.80. For the LAD, it is, uh, there's a significant drop already in the proximal uh, part of the LAD. Circumflex uh, uh, intermediate and uh, uh, obtuse margin are both uh, had a significant uh, pressure drop already in the proximal part of the uh, intermediate and this study for the obtuse marginal FFRCT was 0 0.59. So if you try to uh, assess the, predict the mortality after the PCI or cabbage using the syntax 2020, you could see that there was a clearly uh, difference uh, in uh, 10 years mortality. Cabbage has uh, uh, much lower mortality in this patient, 43.9% uh, mortality with the cabbage. If the PCI was performed, the mortality prediction was 63.4. So uh, uh, for this uh, patient with a high anatomical syntax score, 58.5, uh, the cabbage is the right uh, uh, approach to treat the patient. And cabbage, uh, the surgeon decided to put three bi bypass, uh, one from the uh, left um, saphenous vein graft to the uh, segment three to the right, and the lima to uh, segment eight, saphenous pain to 12A. Actual uh, treatment was slightly different. Instead of the putting the uh, graft in the segment three, the uh, surgeon anastomosed this uh, graph to the segment two. So uh, you could see that the, this is the uh, CT uh, 30 days follow-up, and you can see that the CT shows that quite patent uh, uh, lima to LAD, uh, saphenous pain to the sarc, and also the saphenous pain to the right coronary artery, and anastomosis is quite uh, well documented in this uh, coronary CT. We also performed some uh, FFR CT, and uh, you could see that the uh, um, uh, distally right coronary artery, the significant in improvement of the pressure uh, FFR CT is now 0 0.88, LAD FFR CT is 0 0.91. Uh, circumflex, there's a slight uh, smaller ischemia remaining because the, this study, the FFRCT was 0 0.79. So the uh, enrollment is almost finished for the fast track cabbage trial. We only need to, one more patient to complete this trial, and probably this uh, trial will show the uh, feasibility and the safety of this approach, uh, operating the patient solely based on the CT. Uh, what would be the next? So uh, we also try to incorporate this uh, hologram representation, which is quite maybe useful in the operational theater because you can interact with the, with the images without touching anything. So the, patient, uh, the surgeon could be still sterile uh, by uh, interacting the image with the hologram. And of course, the next step could be the uh, randomization of real patient, either uh, treated only based on the CT or only treated with the conventional uh, invasive coronary angiography. So uh, as a conclusion, that's the, uh, I think, uh, syntax three trial demonstrates that clinical decision making between cabbage and PCI based on CT had a high agreement with the treatment decision derived from the invasive coronary uh, angiography. And the uh, ongoing uh, fast track tri cabbage trial investigate the feasibility of the safety of the planning and executing cabbage based solely on the CT uh, angiography combined with FFRCT without knowledge of the anatomy defined by invasive coronary angiography. Thank you for attention. Thank you for that. Uh, moving on, uh, Peter Schmidt will discuss um, left main insights on technique and results. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, uh, Mamas, and it's a pleasure to, pre to talk about new insights on technique and results. Um, well, you have seen this slide in, in, in different format from previous speakers. It's about the guidelines of the European and American guidelines. I don't think after Excel and Noble and, and the ischemia trial, it will change that much for the American ones. It might downgrade with for the European ones, which are still quite liberal at the moment. Uh, but then again, they are a little bit old. Um, having said that, um, I think it's still very important when you treat left main um, bifurcations that you have to respect that left main disease is rare 
rarely isolated, and this is an old study from, from Gary Mintz on IFAS, showing that even irrespective of your uh, angiographic appearance on your Medina class, um, still you have a um, uh, true bifurcation plaque and uh, going from the left main to the so both side branches, and that in the very minority of the cases you have isolated disease in the, one of the side branches or in the ostium. Um, so the ostium and the mid-shaft disease is the less complex of the left main treatment, as you all know, and um, the most easy one to treat. And, and for that, you still have to use IFAS, I think, for sizing and to exclude side branch disease, as I mentioned before. And, um, and if you put the stent in left main, um, if possible, if the, the left main is long enough, then please confirm your ostium coverage with multiple projections before deploying the stent and have the stent slightly protruded into the aorta to coverage the ostium and flare the stent afterwards. That the osteal and left and med shaft disease uh, uh, stenting have good outcomes is shown in this study, showing uh, in, on a long-term outcome on all-cause deaths and hard endpoints, uh, combined endpoints, uh, all-cause deaths, MI, and stroke, um, so, uh, comparable to, to, uh, to bypass surgery, but still uh, surgery is still outperforms um, PCI on the tar on the revascularizations. It's a different story about the distal left main. It's the most frequent condition, and it is, of course, the most difficult one, and um, you have to consider many things, like lesion and length, complexity of the lesion of the plaque, cyber and size, angulation, clinical setting, and operator experience. And yeah, Mama's already showed this slide, but I think it's nice to show again um, that that indeed, if you look at the if you look at the operators doing left main procedures and you put them in quartiles, that the ones that have the, done the, do the most. Um, um, left main procedures a year are, are actually performing the best on hard endpoints like mortality, as you can see. And the no magic number to treat, it should you should treat at least 16 cases a year. And then the distal left main, what is the, what is your approach? Should it be a professional or two-stand strategy where you can think about dicky crush, culotity, stenting or tap? And um, for that, I think we have recently written this nice uh, state-of-art review paper, um, which has a very nice flow. So if you have an angiography where you have a true, um, true uh, bifurcation or where you, at least where you have cybrance involvement, and in which you might also think that the cybrance has a challenge in access, and if you do ultrasound as well, and then you see that you have severe disease of your side branch with a least length of more than 10 millimeters, and you have a plaque morphology with calcium in the side branch of an arc of more than 60 degrees, you might consider a two-stand strategy. If you have done not do these criteria, then you can go over to the provisional stand strategy and perform a crossover stenting with spot. And afterwards, if you have received, if you have with angiography a side branch occlusion or a, a TB flow grade with, with less than three, or you have a side branch dissection, B or C, or a severe pinching with a 90, more than 90 degrees uh, stenosis, uh, and uh, if you have with endovascular ultrasound a medial dissection or MLA of less than four millimeters square millimeter, or if you choose to have a physiology, if you have a side branch FFR of less than 0.8 or IFR of less than 0.89, you might think about escalating to a two-stand strategy. And if it is not, you can perform your IFIS to confirm that you have done a good job. Um, so if you want to consider a two-stand strategy based on your geography or intervascular um, imaging pre-stenting, pre um, I think that uh, based on the uh, anatomy, the bifurcation angle, and the size of the side branch, you might, to, might choose to be the, the, the DK cross or the culotte. I think DK cross will be the preferred cases in most cases because culotte is probably one, you know, approximately 20% of the cases. Um, if you do the uh, professional stenting and you want to escalate to a two-stand strategy, then based on the anatomy, again on the bifurcation angle and side branch, side branch, you can think about T-stenting, tap, culotte, or reverse crush, but always end with a followed by with a, with a kissing balloon and a repot. I think that is quite important. What is new? Well, new concepts is putting a drug-coated balloon in your in your in your side branch, and only a few uh, small-sized studies on drug-coated balloons showing that on short follow-up you have low low late lumen loss and no restenosis at six and twelve months. They report, and if you have a, looking at a small meta-analysis, it also shows a, a better rates on TLF and TLR with the hybrid approach, meaning provisional stenting and and a and, an, um, and a drug-coated balloon for the side. 
high branch would compare to a two-stand approach. But then again, we don't have randomized controlled trials yet with the hybrid approach yet. There's many, I think there are a few ongoing. One of them is the hybrid depth study, which we, in which we, there's a bifurcation uh, lesion, um, including left mains can be treated with provisional one stent strategy. And if you have a suboptimal result on your side branch, um, then the post patients are randomized between a two stent strategy or a hybrid DAP, with also the possibility of a bill out two stent strategy in case you have a bad result after a hybrid DAP. What is new? Well, I think it's the most new data will come at your PCR in, um, uh, in about two weeks, uh, one, less, than one, yeah, less than two weeks, where we have the five-year results outcome of ABC2. We have the three-year results of the outcome of ABC main. We have a nice study on residual ischemia after left main stenting and the 30 days outcomes of KISS. And you can wonder what is KISS. KISS is a trial that is not specifically looking at left main. It was looking at bifurcations. It was looking at if should we do osteal sideburns intervention after professional stenting. It was to aim to evaluate to non inferiority of no sideburns intervention versus sideburns ballooning in the setting of a single stent with systematic pot. So that's going to be an interesting study and 30-day data will be presented. Having said that, um, I think it's uh, uh, all what you show now as new concepts and new uh, insights. Thank you. So thank you. We're slightly behind on the program. I think we've got maybe two or three minutes for a quick panel discussion and then we can move to the next case. Maybe I can start by opening the first question. I mean, it's really obvious when you have a really tight left main uh, that it needs revascularization, but how do you assess um, significance of left main? Should we just go anatomically, IVERS, FFR? Should we do non-invasive ischemia testing? So who's going to take that? Well, so I'll, I'll point out some data, right? So the Danicad 2 study out of Denmark has shown us that three quarters of the time when the CTA says that it's significant, it's not. And so what that means is that this, this whole fast track cabbage thing means that the vast majority of patients in that study do not need revascularization. That's just the hard facts of it. And if you did PET or MRI before and after, what you'll discover is you're putting an enormous amount of effort into not doing anything. And again, I would flip that question around. All of, the, of all the tools you've listed, you haven't listed the ones that are actually going to give us the answer. We need to be doing high quality, non-invasive imaging before we start to consider these things in patients. The question is, after FAME 3 trial, how much is reliable will be uh, non-invasive FFR in multivalent disease? And how you will get to a final decision without Anjo? Yes, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't really think that FAME 3 was um, a study sh invalidating the role of FFR. I think um, there were a lot of complex lesions where FFR wasn't really necessary, and so that lessened its role. But certainly in the less complex disease, FFR played a key role and um, avoided unnecessary PCI. And I think that is one of the main reasons why the difference between cabbage and PCI had lessened to such a degree in the FAME 3 trial. And we'll be presenting the three-year outcomes at EuroPCR. I encourage you to stay tuned because I think we may see longer-term benefits that we didn't see previously because of some of the role of, of FFR as well as newer generation stents. I have one question for Fahim. Um, so a little bit disappointing to see um, but on the ischemia trial, um, but then again, um, the surgeons, they show benefit um, with the, um, in, in the patients with complete vascularization and a de decreased left ventricle function. Why don't we see this with PCI? Yeah, so I, I, that's, that's a good question. I think this issue of ischemic cardiomyopathy is sort of a mixed bag where a lot of times you have a cardiomyopathy and you have coronary disease and they've got nothing to do with each other. And they, of course, get labeled as ischemic cardiomyopathy. And I think moving forward, if you were to do stitch today with four, you know, classes of drugs and then, uh, you know, good statin therapy, maybe clopidogrel as uh, antiplatelet monotherapy, I'm not sure you'd see a benefit over even over 10 years. And then revive BSIS, which is a more contemporary trial with good medical therapy and Yes, perhaps not the best revascularization compared to surgery, but still pretty good revascularization. You saw no signal of benefit. So I think that this, uh, we, we, we need to pull back from 
this uh, automatic response, which is low EF, multivessel disease, they need to be revascularized. As long as they don't have angina, I mean, if they're having chest pains or they have an acute coronary syndrome, it's a different story. And that obviously needs more study. Uh, you know, we, we don't have enough data, but I think that we need to start pulling back. So we're just going to move on to the next uh, speaker. Now we've got further um, panel discussion at the end of the talks. We're slightly behind. So if I can call Akiko Mahara um, to discuss mechanical issues of left main stenting, particularly around gaps, incomplete crush, defamation, and even more. I mean, it sounds like a real horror show. <laughs> Thank you. Let me start this case. This is 84 years old female, and the patient having the stable angina and post cabbage. And unfortunately, only the patent graft was SVG to right coronary artery. So this distal left main 111 region was unprotected. And after the curot stenting, this is how it looks like the angio. However, the two months later, the patient suffered non STEMI. And you see the circumflex ostium looks like stenotic. And then the other view looks like thrombus. This is how it looks like the keyrot stenting at the time of the index procedure. LOD 7.8 looks good. Left domain 9.1, good. That's female patient. Osteosarc 5.2 may, may not be OK. But more importantly, you see the non stent at the carina site. And this is an IBUS starting the circ here. That's dissection, no cover, and that's left domain. One more time, circumflex coming here. Pay attention the, here. That's dissection. It's very tiny. And this is a reality. In the castle lab, I think everybody missed these findings, but that's how it was. And that's the index procedure, non-stent coverage at Kalina, and that's really small dissection. And if you see more carefully, actually two layers of the stent in this side. So because of the wire is a little bit too distal and bringing the strut from the Kalina to the other side, and actually this making that kind of like deformation. Two months later, this is organized rhombus on the top of the stent, and that's causing current issue. I apologize, this is a little bit old data. This is already Excel data. But I think this still, we don't have enough data to describe this type of the phenomenon. And we consider incomplete clash based on the more than 0.5 millimeter thickness of the entire stent slot or a stent gap. That's happened at the, time, uh, at the non, non uh, carina side frequently. And if you look into the Excel, that's including 127 cases, which we had IBUS at the end of the procedure of the two stent technique in both sides. And we found incomplete stent crush is 28%. And the gap was found is 11%. And if you see the gap, most likely, let's say T stent, and we see the gap at non carina side. And, but if we see the crush or a keyrot, it's many different type, meaning where exactly the wire was uh, rewired. Meaning like the case which I show, the keyrot stenting, the actually the gap was found in the Kalina site. And this is not infrequent. And this is a case of the other phenomenon. And you see the severe left main disease and after stent and KBT, and this is final. I show this case many times, but that's emphasized, I really would like to emphasize. And this is a stand from that this is an osteoleftomy, which was not covered, which is OK, because this is non-disease segment. And going to the distal leftomy, and operator thought that the distal leftomy is under-expanded. And then he or, he or she expanded more. And after the additional ballooning, you see the nice expansion at the distal leftomy. However, this is only one stand has to be one layer. And before additional touching, only one layer here. But after the additional ballooning, you see the double layer of the stent. And this is so-called deformation. And because of this, if we measure the minimum stent area, this tau left man, it was the reason of the additional expansion. It's 7.0 to 9.8 looks good. But if you go to the proximal segment, at the side of the OK segment is 7.8 to 6.4. So I think the message was, there is a two important point. Number one, has to be recognized. 
And if so, many times, inner layer of the stent is actually already smaller compared to before, and has to be expanded again because that's already underexpanded. And the second point was, this is actually deformation and shortening of the stent. And sometimes you miss a region which originally covered. So especially at the edge, after this happened, you have to double check you didn't miss the region. And in this case, it was OK because proximal portion was originally not disease, and that has to be expanded more. So this type of phenomenon happens 6.5% in the Excel trial, and the majority at the left main ostium, where the guiding is pass. And we compare with result deformation. What's the difference in terms of the procedure? And the findings are actually very clear. If the operator using the large guiding or a long uh, multiple region or a long procedure, meaning really the complex region subset, even in the same cohort. So as much as possible you do more work, that's more likely to happen. It's really outside of the uh, region segment. But, however, this is actually somehow interesting. If we measure how much protruding to the left man, if we count based on the IBIS, with result deformation, actually the length was not different. Meaning really carefully uh, insert the guide and we can do without deformation. In terms of the outcome, if the patient having deformation, even after adjusting the minimum stent area, they have poor outcome. But I think I show this data, but I think this is, I interpret it as a little, a little bit differently, meaning those patients having more complex disease. So that's the reason operator has to work hard, but ultimately they had the deformation. Probably this represents more likely the complex region subset. But I think some of them, because of the, due to the deformation, missing the region, or causing the smaller stent area due to the deformation, that has to be corrected. To summarize, I think uh, when you decide to put a two-stand technique, I think the quality of the two-stand technique is really the key. After the two-stand technique in the distal left arm bifurcation, we see at the collar, stent gap was found 11%, and incomplete clash was found is 28%. But I would emphasize, nobody has the DK clash at this point. So maybe the data could be slightly different once we start doing the DK clash. After this style left domain PCI, uh, I'm sorry, this is including any kind of left domain uh, PCI, stent deformation at Austin was observed 6.5%, and that's associated with the poor outcome. Thank you. Could we continue um, with the next speaker? Um, it's from uh, Dr. Yong Min An uh, about optimal minimal stent area for left main cross technique. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'm Chung Min Nan from Asan Medical Center. My topic is the optimal scenario for left main cross technique. Actually, the, for the true left main bifurcation, so the simple crossover has been considered as uh, the uh, default strategy. However, inevitably, so, uh, we have to do the two stand technique based on the random trial, pre combat trial, 50. 4% of patients received two stenting XL, 35% novel, 40% different stent technique, uh, stent, two stent technique. How about the randomized trial? DK, tri DK cross 5, and we have EBC main trial. DK cross 5 trial favored the DK cross, and EBC main trial favored the one stenting better. But uh, even in the DK cross 5 trial, the provisional group, the 47% of patients received the two stenting. EBC main trial, the provisional group, finally, the 22% of patients received the two stent technique. So actually to improve the patient outcome, we have to know the, how to optimize the two stent technique. But, so previously, Dr. Kang, as a medical center, <coughs> reported the importance of a minimum stent lumen area, five, six, seven, eight. But in, in those days, uh, uh, this study included a very heterogeneous population, the single stenting and two stenting. Two stenting uh, among the two stenting techniques, the 115, the 99 is cross sheet and the 15 is T stenting. So because of very heterogeneous population and uh, follow up, uh, this criteria is based on the nine month uh, follow up angiogram. So we need uh, 
the new criteria for dedicated for the two cent technique, particularly cross technique, based on the long term follow up data. Previous exit trial, trial suggested a different criteria, 6, 7, 10, a little bit larger criteria than our previous criteria, and Spain registry criteria also a little bit different uh, criteria suggested. So the last <coughs> So in the last, last 14 years, we gathered the whole uh, crush technique population and uh, who have the both pull like from the LAD to left main and circumference left main. So we, we try to determine the optimal minimum sectional area in each left main segment. The, during the five years, uh, 35 years limited the event number, 35 events occurred in five years. 292 patients in all included cross technique complete I was imaging both sides. This is baseline characteristics. The patient age is 64, male is around 80, the diabetes is one third, ejection fraction is quite normal, true bifurcation. So this is a procedural characteristic. For region modification is 86 percent, total stat number is 2.7. Main branch is the number is 1.5, diameter is 3.6, length is 28, so post dilatation is 90%, the maximum applied pressure is around 200, side branch, stand number is 1.1, stand diameter is 3.1, so maximum volume pressure is 3.1, the pressure is 18, final kissing was done in all, all cases. Second generation D is used in the 80%. This is I was finding of the each segment of left main. This left main minimum stand area was 11, around 11. LAD osteum 8, the circumflex osteum by circumflex pullback 5.9. So we evaluated the circumflex osteum and LAD osteum and this left main. So this is distribution of minimum stand area Circumflex osteo median minimum stand area is 5.8, LED osteo 8.0, this lemon is 10.8. So based on the five-year clinical outcomes, we determine the uh, best cutoff value to determine uh, to best predict the five-year clinical outcomes. This left main 11.8, LED osteo 8.3, circumflex 5.7. So. Interestingly, this left main did not show that any association, the minimum stand area and clinical outcomes, because I think that already this left main is already enough large. If we optimize the, the circumflex and LED, uh, we, we achieve the sufficient stand area of LED and circumflex. LED also a minimum stand area is associated, linearly associated with the maze. The particularly circumflex osteum very nicely showed the linear association with the small, small minimum stand area of a circumflex osteum is associated with increased risk of mace at five year. So according to the criteria, the smaller and larger, so left main minimum stand area was not associated with outcome. So LAD less than 0.83, larger than 0.83, there was a significant difference regarding the mace and all cause death. Circumflex osteum also less than 5.7, larger than 5.7, associated with the MACE, and MACE means including the death MI repeat intervention, and all cause death. So we combine the groups according to the under expansion of each, uh, each, each segment. Do we only consider the circumflex osteum and LED osteum because this left main is not associated with the uh, maze at five years, so no, no under expanded, uh, in the, in, uh, no under expansion group is group zero. Both under expansion group group two, either exp under expansion is group one. Compared with the group zero, group one, group two, significantly higher rate of maze and all cause death. Myocardial infarction is very small, but no difference. Target lesion evascularization is significantly higher in patients with both under-expanded, under-expansion in circumflex osteum and LAD osteum. So this is my summary. In patient undergoing left main two stain technique with a crush, final minimum stain area 
with an LED and circumflex osteum showed a linear relationship with the heterofibular outcomes. Larger minimal sand area was associated with better clinical outcomes. Optimal minimal sand area, the predicted five-year maze on segment basis is a LAD 8.3, circumflex 5.7, the left main 11.8, the larger than previous hour criteria 5.678, similar to the Excel criteria. Obtaining sufficient large MSA could be pivotal in preventing adverse clinical events in patients underwent left main to stent technique. So look at full expansion population, fiber event rate is only 6.4, including the death MI repeat intervention. So only 1% per year. So interventionist should make effort to achieve the sufficient minimum stand area under the IVOS guidance. Thank you for your attention. So, very thought-provoking talk. If I can invite now Bill Fearon uh, to discuss the unmet need for FFR in left main PCI. Bill, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mamas. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about coronary physiology and left main disease. Uh, those are my disclosures. What I'd like to try to cover are three uh, points. The first is, why should we use coronary physiology um, instead of or in addition to intravascular imaging to assess left main? Um, is coronary physiology reliable for evaluating uh, left main disease? And what are some of the issues that we need to be aware of uh, when we're using coronary physiology? So for many years, uh, intravascular ultrasound uh, has been used to assess left main disease. Um, this is dating back to 1999. However, we've come to appreciate that the ischemic potential of left main disease uh, is more complex than just looking at the minimum lumen diameter or minimum lumen area. Uh, as shown in this cartoon, certainly the uh, area stenosis plays a role in the functional significance of left main disease, but also the length of the lesion, the reference area, and in particular, the flow uh, across the lesion uh, plays a key role, and intravascular imaging is uh, currently unable to really assess the maximum flow across the stenosis. And so the pressure wire is able to uh, incorporate all of these entities um, and give us an answer. Now, another issue uh, highlighting uh, the problem with just looking at anatomy alone uh, are shown in the next two slides. This is a study from the United States comparing uh, FFR with uh, IVUS and finding that the optimal IVUS cutoff was around six square millimeters for uh, identifying a significant left main stenosis. This study uh, from Asan Medical Center, uh, it's, uh, done in a similar fashion, uh, found that actually the best cutoff was 4.8 square millimeters, which is obviously quite different from six. And when we think about why that might be, it's not too surprising. You know, in the United States, in a larger person, uh, six square millimeters may not be an adequate enough lumen to supply flow to the left coronary, whereas um, in a smaller uh, person, six square millimeters is perfectly adequate. And so for that reason, uh, we've moved away uh, from just looking at the anatomic uh, component and incorporating physiology in assessing left main. And so what data do we have to support uh, that approach? Uh, well, more than 20 years ago, uh, Nico Pyle's group did this study in a little over 50 patients with equivocal left main disease where they deferred intervention uh, or revascularization if the FFR was negative and showed that there was an excellent survival out to three years in the deferral group. Uh, also, a very low or similar MACE rate to the revascularization group. <laughs> Uh, an, another group in the United States performed a similar study and found the same thing, excellent survival um, out to three years and low MACE rate as well uh, when deferring revascularization based on a negative FFR. Uh, the largest uh, study, a single center study from Bernard de Bruyne's group in Alst, Belgium, looked at a little over 200 patients and uh, also found that if those patients had a negative FFR and had deferral of the left main revascularization, the, they had an excellent uh, survival rate um, as well as MACE rate, similar to the, the revascularized group. So um, based on that, uh, we have good data for FFR. How about uh, IFR? 
This is a more recent study comparing IFR to IVIS and looking at a cutoff of six square millimeters for IVIS and showing a moderate uh, correlation between um, IFR and IVIS. Uh, this is an interesting study that was just recently published um, looking at 300 patients with intermediate left main where IFR was measured as well as FFR and IVIS. And shown here is the uh, results when the pressure wire was in the LAD. And you see in the concordantly positive group, the vast majority had a, low, a small MLA. And in the concordantly negative, uh, uh, the vast majority had a large MLA. So showing good uh, agreement between physiology and IVIS. In the discordant group, uh, FFR positive, IFR negative, uh, most of them had a small MLA, and FFR negative, IFR positive, the reverse was true. Uh, interestingly, when you looked in the circumflex, uh, for the concordant group, uh, either both positive or both negative, you, you still had a good agreement with IVIS, but in the discordant group, it was a little bit different um, compared to the LAD when you're looking in the circumflex. Uh, fortunately, the discordance uh, was a small uh, number of patients. Now, how about uh, IFR to defer uh, revascularization? This uh, was studied in the Define Left Main Registry. Uh, Dr. Warasawa and colleagues published these data in over 300 patients with intermediate left main where, based on IFR, they were either revascularized or deferred. And they found uh, that out to three years, there was a, a low uh, event rate that was similar to revascularization in the uh, deferral group based on IFR. So I'd like to finish by just talking about a few uh, issues that we need to be aware of. Um, one of them is what was already mentioned that, you know, left main disease often occurs in the presence of downstream disease and is rarely isolated. And certainly with FFR, we've been aware of this issue where um, when you do a pullback, you may have a FFR 0.64, and then the PDPA between the two lesions is 0.84, suggesting maybe the left main is not significant. But then when you remove that uh, distal stenosis, there's greater flow across the left main, and the actual FFR is lower. We refer to this as crosstalk or hemodynamic um, interdependence. Now, um, we were interested in looking at whether the non-hyperemic pressure ratios, and in particular IFR, might be prone to crosstalk like FFR because, um, you know, IFR, one of the tenets of it is by measuring, uh, by looking at just diastole, you're looking at uh, similar to hyperemic flow, and so it's almost like FFR. And so for that reason, you might also expect crosstalk. And so Jung Min An, um, who just spoke uh, when he was doing research with us at Stanford, led this study. Uh, in our animal lab looking at a porcine model where he created uh, serial stenoses, a fixed proximal and a variable distal stenosis or a variable proximal and fixed distal stenosis and measured uh, pressure distally between the two stenoses and more proximally and looked at the absolute change of the pressure ratio across the fixed stenosis according to the variable degree or, or the amount of crosstalk, so to speak. And as um, the theory would be that as the stenoses become more severe, you might see more evidence of crosstalk um, between the two stenoses. And um, interestingly, what he found was that both FFR and IFR had similar degrees of crosstalk, and resting PDPA uh, actually had the least amount of crosstalk, which again is not too surprising since PDPA resting includes the systolic component where there's less flow and less difference. Um, when you look at this more carefully, based on how severe the serial stenoses were, at mild stenoses, FFR had the most crosstalk compared to IFR and PDPA. But as you got more and more severe, IFR actually ended up having more than FFR. And again, at, at the most severe, you'll have complete uh, loss of autoregulation. And basically, at, at quote unquote rest, you're, you're at hyperemia and you're looking at sort of a diastolic FFR when you measure IFR in that case. So um, the conclusion was that when assessing serial stenoses, non-hyperemic pressure ratios are affected by crosstalk. Uh, when the functional significance of the stenosis is severe, the effect is similar to FFR. So I think this is something to be aware of. Now, some would then ask, well, why don't we just measure it down the non-diseased vessel um, instead? 
Uh, the issue here is that this proximal LAD lesion can still affect the flow across the left main and your interpretation of FFR in the circumflex. And this depends on the severity of the stenosis and how much mass um, the LAD is supplying. And if you, relieve, if you remove that LAD stenosis, now there may be more flow and you might get a lower FFR. We looked at this also in an in vitro animal model and then in a human study where basically after stenting either the LAD or circumflex uh, in patients that needed that, we then um, put a winged balloon in the left main and pressure wires down both vessels and put a shorter and smaller balloon in the LAD to create uh, variable stenosis. And the apparent FFR was the FFR on the circumflex with a stenosis in the LAD. And the true FFR was the FFR on the circumflex with no um, balloon inflated. And then the FFR epi was the uh, FFR in the LAD with or without the balloon inflated. And what you see up here in the top panel is inflation of the LAD balloon creating uh, a severe stenosis. And then when we look at the FFR on the circumflex, it increases slightly when you have a severe LAD stenosis, again, because the flow across the left main has lessened because of that downstream disease. Now, fortunately, this difference was quite small, uh, although statistically significant, uh, when you look at the FFR values. And it really was only apparent when you had a very severe LAD stenosis with an FFR below 0.45. So um, with more, uh, they're still significant, but more moderate stenoses, you didn't see as much of an effect. And in fact, if your apparent FFR and your circumflex was over 0.85, the true FFR was always above 0.80 when you uh, relieved that LAD stenosis. So in general, we can still rely on uh, FFR in the non-diseased vessel, even if the other vessel has a disease in it. So in conclusion, both FFR and IFR correlate with intravascular imaging, but with variable MLA, depending on the population studied. Deferring left main revascularization based on coronary physiology appears to be safe. When performing coronary physiology to assess left main disease, one needs to be aware of downstream disease and the possibility for crosstalk between lesions, even if using non-hyperemic pressure ratios like IFR. And doing a pressure wire pullback in the least disease vessel can help to isolate the contribution of the left main disease. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bill. Um, we continue with a talk from uh, Professor Do Yong Kang, how to manage left main instant stenosis. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I'm Do Yong Kang from Asa Medical Center. Today I'll talk about the how to manage left main ISR. Uh, Begin with the case. The 64-year-old male patient with angina and uh, this tire left main bifurcation stenting one year ago. And initial CAG at the in index PCI showed this left main bifurcation disease as some um, Fox circumflex and the left main. And initial PCI was done with a crush technique. And CAG after one year showed severe risk stenosis. And many studies that compared KBG versus PCI uh, in the left main disease, uh, except for the novel, showed similar, but not very different uh, outcome after randomization. Uh, in main compared 10-year follow-up in registry data, the 10-year outcome was similar to the in death QMI or stroke. However, TVR rate was much higher in PCI compared to cabbage. So we can say that TVR the main ISR is the Achilles heel of the, the left main stenting. Uh, there are some limited evidence of the left main ISR. Uh, the data is increasing, so I made it in one uh, slide. And from 2009 to 2020, there are several uh, registry data from all over the world. Then how about the incidence of left main ISR? In routine angiographic follow-up studies, uh, mainly the rate was about 10% to 20%. But you can see in, in another registries, there are some studies that are reported a lower rate. There was the routine follow-up angiography was not mandatory. In the FAILS registry and cardio group registry, about half of the patient underwent routine CAG follow-up. And COPAR study that no one underwent routine follow-up study uh, reported a lower rate of the ISR. And the, the, 
Those are these three studies with a restenosis rate less than 10%. However, the overall MACE rate was not different, not so different with a routine uh, angiographic follow-up patient. Now, how about the clinical presentation? The FAILS registry showed that about one third, one third of the patient showed elective uh, control and silent ischemia, and another one third was silent stable angina. In Asian Medical Center registry, about half patient about the silent and stable angina patient, and another half was on stable angina patient. Up to myocardial infarction, patients was only 3%, also in AMC registry and FAILS registry. So then main patient, major patient uh, comes with a stable angina and some patient with unstable angina. Octet myocardial infarction rate is very small. Then do we need follow-up angiography for left main PCI? There is limited data, very small registry data. This is the data from a phase two registry that compared the planned angiographic control versus clinical follow-up patient and did the propensity score matching in 220 patients. The MACE rate was a little bit higher in planned angiography follow-up, but that rate uh, showed a trend of the a higher rate in clinical follow-up patient, so the others uh, concluded that we need a random study for the more uh, data. And another registry data also showed a similar result that si looks similar, but we need more uh, data and need randomized control trial, but not done yet. Last year, we did, uh, reported a post-PCI trial. Then in 1,700 high-risk patient underwent PCI in real world and routine stress testing with the myocardial spect or treadmill or dopamine stress echo versus symptom-oriented care. And two-year clinical follow-up event of the death and my hospitalization for unstable angina was not different between the two strategies. Uh, there was a specified key subgroup analysis, including left main disease. In patient, uh, the patient number was not so large, but however, there was no difference even in left main disease. So I think that the routine, angiogra routine the angiographic follow-up did not show the clear benefit of the maze, and routine, the functional test follow-up did not also show the benefit of the cl better clinical outcome. So I, I personally, I do not recommend routine fun angiographic follow-up for even for after left main PCI. And how about the angiographic presentation? In planned follow-up CAG patient, maybe the earlier detection with a focal ISR and the clinically driven follow-up CAG patient showed more diffuse ISR. And the timing of the left main ISR was mostly one year, maybe related to the angiographic follow-up. Then the location of the left main ISR, you can see that in the single stand and also two stand technique, the pre-combat two trial, the major was happened in the circumflex ostium. Then the classic heel of the left main stenting is the circumflex ostium. And the mechanism, uh, I wrote it here that not very well evaluated yet, but after the, the Archicos lecture, I now more understand. And major patient has an intimate hyperplasia and under expansion. This kind of the, the patient with a no good stent expansion but disease has the uh, neo intimate hyperplasia. But in this case, you can see that stent itself is under expanded and that would be because of the under expansion. That these two would be the main mechanism. <coughs> and also, stent deformation would be another cause. And the, the we know that the previous data, the if, if we get the bigger stand area, the, the mass rate is low. And Dr. An also said that the, if we grow, make a bigger, more bigger rumen area, the mass rate would be more lower. So the, I think that the prevention is better than cure. So to prevent the left main ISR is to optimize the first index left main, the PCI uh, procedure. Then how to treat this, case of th this kind of case? Uh, in registry data in fails, the major patient underwent PCI and 10% underwent cabbage. In other medical center registry and MITO registry showed similar the proportion of the PCI and cabbage. And clinical outcomes of the left main ISR 
shows the overall mass. The valve duration is variable, but about 20% to 30% of the overall mass. In uh, old data, on 10 years ago, the after left main ISR, about 14% uh, experienced the MACE after uh, left main uh, TLR, and the KVG PCI medical street also showed a similar benefit. And we updated the data with the recent uh, more, more patient, and temp about 11% of the left main PCI under experienced TLR. A major patient experienced at, uh, before two years, and others uh, was uh, the late staging. And in the after left main TLR, the all cause mortality and cardiac death was not different even compared to the non TLR patient with the time varying coxal analysis. And the, the patient under, underwent TLR within two years, at, and after two years, the clinical outcome was not, the death outcome was not different compared to the non TLR patient. So, in many patients, the left main TLR is not very uh, the very, not very, uh, very malignant event. And clinical out outcomes of the left main ISR after DS versus POBA, the cardiac death and MI and was similar in the, the Takagi's uh, report, and TLR was higher in POBA alone compared to DS. And other report shows that TLR and cardiovascular mortality, the TLR is similar between DS and DS, however, the increased mortality in DS group was reported, but there would be some uh, selection bias. In our registry data, the DS and balloon angioplasty, DEB, uh, the patient with the only POBA showed higher cardiac death and MI, but TLR rate was uh, not different between a uh, patient, and that would be because of the selection bias of the patient. That, so my solution for this patient, I did a drug eluting balloon, with a sequential high pressure and DEB with a kissing, and the patient is doing well over five years now. This is final CAG. A conclusion, uh, I do not need routine angiography follow-up in after uh, left main PCI, and DEB for ISR and DES for de novo side branch or main vessel downstream disease, and cabbage for recurrent ISR, uh, I recommend. And prevention is better than cure. Optimizing stem result and index left main PCI will prevent left main ISR. Thank you for your attention. So we've got 10, 15 minutes panel discussion. Um, so we can start if there's any questions. Maybe I can ask the first question to Demetrius. Um, we've just heard the discussion around um, the drug eluting balloon versus stent in, in stent restenosis. What would guide your decision making? In left main? Yes, in left main. Uh, in two stent technique, so yes. I have a two stent technique. Uh, I think that the diffuseness of the disease in the location. So I would feel much more comfortable doing a DCB in uh, the left circumflex after optimizing with intravascular ultrasound than reconstructing the whole. If it's uh, diffuse, if the stenosis is both in the LED, the left main, and the left circumflex, then that might push me towards sending this patient for bypass surgery instead of trying to uh, redo uh, a PCI. Does it depend on the type of instant resinosis? Yes. That means diffuse disease, you'll... Diffuse and location. Okay. If all three branches are restenosed, left main, LED, and CERC, I think that should tell you something that yes. maybe this patient does not do well with uh, stents. Bill, um, you, you talked very much about using physiology um, to guide left main intervention, but you didn't really mention anything about post-PCI, I mean, what's the role of physiology in those cases? Do we have much data for left main? Yeah, um, I think there is a role, uh, particularly for the jailed circumflex when you're doing a provisional side branch uh, PCI, but ultimately I think you need intravascular imaging um, to really optimize your stent result. So, you know, in general, uh, I'm not, you know, I don't think there's as big a role. We still need more data for the whole post-PCI uh, FFR or IFR uh, showing that acting on it really improves outcomes, which we don't have yet. Uh, maybe that's coming, so uh, we'll wait on that. But, but there could be a role for, for jailed side branch evaluation. Can I ask a question to Bill? 
Uh, so uh, you showed some very nice uh, slides where there is concordance and discordance between physiology and plaque burden and, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, when they're concordant, I think we can all agree that it's probably safe uh, to, to defer. We know, though, that the higher plaque burden in the left main, and I, actually Kiko has a very nice study, uh, even if it's not hemodynamically significant and does not meet the criteria for ML, uh, uh, MLA, uh, has worse prognosis. So what do you do when you have a discordant? You have four millimeters square and a negative uh, yeah. uh, ischemic yeah. uh, indices. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you have to always use your clinical judgment and take into account all the factors. I mean, certainly if the patient has typical symptoms, you know, you, you want to check to make sure that your physiologic test was done appropriately. Maybe if you're doing a resting, you'll give some adenosine and see if the FFR, you know, to see if there's a, a different result there. Um, and then, you know, ultimately you got to you know, take all of that information together. And I think also it depends on how negative your FFR or IFR is. If it's like an FFR 0.82, you know, that's different than 0.95, obviously. Thank you. I, I have, sorry, sorry, I have one question for, for Yoshi. Um, Yoshi, you're very familiar with all the CT, FFR, CT, FFR um, procedures and, and studies. So, um, well, in, in practice, uh, we see a lot. Uh, we patients refer to CAT lab from, um, on, based on the, on the CT angiogram, and often we are a little bit uh, yeah, disappointed by the fact that we have no significant lesions. Um, so um, you do your study with FFR CT, um, and you do it well with heart flow. But how well is that, and, and how well are the others, other companies? So I think, uh, yeah, FFRCT heart flow is the one of the commercialized uh, the service, and it's a central core of, uh, in uh, in uh, in the uh, uh, United States. So you have to send the data to the um, uh, heart flow, and then they will uh, analyze the CT and get back to us the result in a few hours. I think there's a couple of uh, other softwares like Siemens has one, and also the Pulse Medical has one. Uh, and also the uh, Canon has uh, one uh, uh, local uh, uh, FFRCT program, but uh, I think the, in general the uh, uh, calculation of this uh, um, um, Navier stocks and all the calculation takes time, that's, that's one thing. And I think the uh, local FFRCT is not really commercialized uh, probably because of the uh, um, yeah, the patent and the software thing. So all the research performed by the uh, local FFRCT looks quite good, but it's not uh, yet commercially or the clinically available. Okay. Thank you. Let's go. There's one question there over there. Yeah. Uh, my question is to Dr. Keiko Mera. Uh, this is about the stent shortening that you mentioned. Um, in your data set, is there any stent that's less or more prone to shortening, uh, um, you know, the Megatron, for example, or any other stand? Because you, you're right, it is, a, it is a real problem. Sometimes it does happen. Good. I think we have come to the end of the, uh, this session, and uh, thank you for attending, and uh, thank you for participating. Thank, thank you. you. Okay.